there are some other approaches that can be taken to handling collisions in hash tables. And we'll talk about a couple of those. Rehashing and cuckoo hashing. Rehashing is exactly what it sounds like. You do the hashing again, except you do it into a larger table. So it's resizing, essentially. But it also affords you some other opportunities. Um, we usually do rehashing when the load gets above a certain threshold because the table is getting too full or when an insertion fails for example in our um, probing schemes if we attempted a probe and we weren't able to find a place to insert that's an indication that our table is getting too full or that it's kind of too clustered and we should do something to address that it will spread the keys back out so that we've got more empty spaces throughout our hash table because we have more space in general. It gives us an opportunity to tweak our hash function and make it better if we've seen a way that it could be made better. We're also able to remove any keys that were marked as deleted if we were using uh, a probing scheme in which we decided to leave the keys there. Um, this could speed up our searches because we would have to pass by fewer deleted nodes to get to a location where something is stored. It costs O of N for an individual uh, resizing or rehashing, but as we've seen for other schemes where we did doubling, if it amortizes to O of 1, if we use the doubling kind of scheme for it. The other approach that we'll look at for collision handling is cuckoo hashing. It's based on this idea that having two possible choices is actually very powerful when we're handling a problem like hash collision or any problem where we might have sort of a limitation on us there. So we use multiple hash tables, at least two, and each one has its own hash function. So something won't typically hash to the same place in hash table one as it would in hash table two. Each of them must be more than half empty at any given time, and each key can have only one nest, one hash index in each table. So we shouldn't have our keys mapping to multiple indexes in those tables. This is sort of a standard hash table kind of thing. And we need to be able to guarantee that a key exists only in one nest at a time. We don't want to store two values for the same key. So we want to check where it would have hashed to in any of our hash tables if we are updating the value for that key, for example or if we're trying to insert that key. The insertion for the algorithm, or the insertion algorithm for cuckoo hashing is, if the key is already present, the key K, then we don't insert it. And that's present in any of our hash tables, both if we're using two. We then look for where K would hash to in table one if there's already something that is hashed to that location that's a different key not the same as our key then we evict it like the cuckoo birds eggs hatch and those chicks push the uh, the chicks out of the nests that they're in it's a little grotesque but it's the metaphor that's used here we evict it to another hash table and we insert k in that location then we try to place that other key that was already there, A, we try to place it using the other hash table with its other hash function. And if where we were to, trying to put A was already data, we can evict that into the original, the first hash table. And we could keep doing this for some limited amount of time or um, for some limited number of attempts. So here's an animation of inserting with cuckoo hashing. Six was empty, we're able to insert it there. Then two was empty, we're able to insert it there. 
then this new, new blue value goes into 6, which evicts what was in 6, and the red value hashes to 4 in the other table. 10 is fine, nothing was there. 4 is fine because nothing was there in the first table. And then we go to hash to 4, we have to evict what was already in 4 into the other hash table. And eventually as it fills up, we're going to get collisions where it might cause multiple evictions like this one here. It's evicting lots of things. And sometimes we'll reach a point where there's a limit to it that we've evicted too much. And then we have to handle that. But here we're evicting and we've now found enough places for all of the values. Obviously this makes insertions a little more expensive when we have to evict, um, but not that terribly uh, expensive, especially if we put some limit, some co constant limit on how many evictions we'll do before we try some other approach. So insertions can fail. Um, if our load factor is too high, for example, if both of our lists were almost full or all full, then of course we could fail to insert because we'll just keep evicting back and forth all throughout. We usually make a limit that the load factor in either of the lists can be no higher than 0.5 to avoid that. And if the eviction chain gets too long, we may have some boundary that we put on it, as I mentioned before. We detect that failure either by um, the amount of time that we've taken trying to place something or by some count on how many times we're allowed to loop in evicting data. One solution is we could expand our tables and rehash if we have had to evict too many times Obviously, we still want to store whatever keys we were asked to store in our table, so we might resize our hash tables and then rehash to redistribute and lower that load, uh, that load factor there. For instance, if we double the size of the table and reinsert things using rehashing, either doing some new hash functions or repeating with the hash functions that, that we have, depending on what would serve our purposes best here. The complexity is O of 1 for searching and deleting because it's some constant number of hash tables and at most we'll have to check all of those hash tables. If we have 2 or 4 or whatever, that's still O of 1. It's a constant fixed number of the hash tables. And deletion doesn't need to do any real cleanup in them because we just delete from wherever the location was that we found that key. It doesn't have the cleanup issues of probing, for example, where we would risk not finding later data. Insert, even if we have to try to evict multiple times, that's O of 1 because we'll set some boundary, some limit on it. And if we hit that limit, yes, we'll resize, which itself is an O of 1, op or I'm sorry, O of N operation. But in amortized time, if we use a doubling scheme, then it can be O of 1. The worst case is still O of N for an individual insert because of the need to expand and rehash. So users may not like those individual inserts where we've hit our uh, number of evictions and realize that we need to resize the hash table. The worst case of the number of evictions is less than log n. And the space and efficiency can be improved with some modifications such as adding buckets at hash indexes so that we've got some constant size amount that we might have to search within those buckets, um, just like we have the constant number of hash tables. As long as we keep them constant sized, then 
the search within those buckets is still constant. And we could also use more hash tables and more hash functions for those hash tables. And that gives us more places to try to hash things into when we have to do those evictions. So here's some analysis or some, some actual experiments on uh, the cuckoo scheme. So if we have two hash tables versus three hash tables versus four hash tables, and whether we do some buckets there or not. So here is with no buckets. And with no buckets, if we go up to four hash tables, then we can actually get to a load of 0.97 without having hitting our limit of evictions. If we give two items per cell, if we do a bucket of size two, then even with only two hashes, we can get to a load of 0.86 without hitting our maximum number of evictions and 0.99 with four hash tables. If we have four possible items per cell, four spots in our buckets, then we're already in the 90% with only two hashes. So again, these keep constant and so we still treat it as constant time. Um, we don't grow them like our, our open schemes, but we're allowed to uh, still put more than one thing in those cells and we get very, very high load possibilities without hitting our eviction limit with four hash tables in, in the four items per cell scheme. Finally, we'll discuss a little bit about the idea of perfect hashing, which I mentioned before. So perfect hashing is hashing with no collisions, meaning that there are no two keys that will hash to the same index in our array. It would be beautiful. And it can be beautiful sometimes when we know the entire key set in advance. We know, for example, all of the words in our dictionary or all of the possible values for a particular identifier then we can get perfect hashing with it. There are schemes that we can come up with. Um, examples of this would be keywords in a programming language. We know what those keywords are going to be, and so we can, we can s create a hash for them in advance that maps everybody to a perfect index. A dictionary for spelling, again, if we know all of the words already. Um, and then file lists in various media formats. Again, we know the files. We can set up a table for them, a perfect hash table for them that they all map to directly. So the worst case will be O of one time for lookups, for insertion, for deletion, any of the above, because everybody has their one perfect slot to fit to. Um, and it takes O of N space. We can fit exactly to our data or within a pretty good range of our data if we come up with that perfect hash function. So to compare with binary search, if we have a dictionary with 30,000 words and no additions after we've established that dictionary, then our goal is fast spell checking and using minimal storage. Um, and almost all of our searches would be successful, then binary search takes about 360 kilobytes and its time is log n, which is less than 15 probes per access in the worst case, but with a hash table with separate chaining in it, we can have a load of two giving us 540 kilobytes, so it takes a little more storage space, but our probes that we have to do in those chainings, in those, uh, that hash table there, are about, or are two probes on average. And so this is much quicker in terms of the lookups than the 15 probes that we have to do in the binary search, especially if we're doing these lots and lots of times we're scanning through an entire document to do spell check on every word in someone's draft of their novel for example 
it will make a difference if we're doing two probes versus 15 probes to do our binary search. So hash tables can achieve O of 1 search, insert, and remove with some of those good schemes for them. And we can achieve O of N storage for dynamic key sets. Collisions can be resolved by combining different approaches, such as separate chaining or open addressing, or in other words, the bucketing versus using a different slot within the hash table. We can grow them by rehashing, and we can use multiple hash tables, like in the cuckoo scheme, to allow for more distribution and to be able to sort of shift things between those hash tables. But hashing does not support ordered access, like getting a minimum, a maximum, the successors that we've looked at in binary trees, or getting ranges of things. So there are still some capabilities that something like a binary search tree is going to be better at, or something like a sorted array is going to be better at. But our hash tables can do this job of lookup for us very, very well.